Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We are absolutely delighted to uh, feature a panel of guest presenters today. We're going to be looking at Texas economic development uh, in 2022, trends, challenges, and opportunities. Uh, my name is Elisa Sklar. I am the VP of Marketing for GIS Planning. Um, and I am absolutely thrilled to have with us today some guest presenters. I'll start off by introducing them and then um, we will uh, let them speak a little bit about the, their perspectives on our topic today and then we'll, we'll take some questions as well. Um, so off the top, what I have here uh, as an introduction for Carlton Schwab, who many of you, of course, will know. He is the president and CEO of the Texas Economic Development Council, and he has been president and CEO there since February 1999. So uh, so you've, you've had a lot of time to really develop your expertise about economic development in Texas. Um, and during that time, the 870 member TEDC has developed into a recognized leader in the professional development of its members and a powerful voice for economic development policy in the state of Texas. Uh, our second guest with us today is Chuck Vanderbilt. Um, Chuck is the executive director of the East Texas Council of Governments. Uh, and you have been there, Chuck, for four years. I see the community and economic development manager. Uh, in this position, uh, Chuck supports East Texas jurisdictions seeking solutions to community needs, including facilitating the regional broadband initiative. And he also oversees at COGS environmental programs and the small business uh, lending program, which is fantastic. Um, we have Nathan joining us as well. Nathan Tafoya is the executive director of the Mount Pleasant EDC. Um, Nathan, you are, there you go. I just wanted to invite you to share with us your, um, your uh, uh, webcam as well. It's great to have you all here. And I'm really delighted to start off the new year with this feature on economic development in Texas. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for having us. Now, I also wanted to thank the many attendees who are taking time out of their busy days to join us for this conversation about economic development in Texas. I'm going to start off uh, by turning this over to you, Carlton, to uh, speak about your perspective on opportunities, challenges, and trends for 2022 when it comes to economic development. Thank you, Elisa, and uh, thanks for inviting us. And it's a pleasure to be with you all this morning. And uh, you know, as I was thinking about my remarks, it's 23, almost 23 months ago that uh, we had an event, a winter meeting in College Station, and the world was normal as we knew it. We had a good attendance. We hadn't been uh, in College Station for a number of years and uh, came back to Austin after that event. Uh, and about 10 days later, we were shut down. Uh, really, uh, our office was shut down for most of the rest of the year. Um, but of course, we kept working and we we adapted just like everyone else. And uh, and 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 here we are, nearly two years later. Um, you know, when we uh, talked about um, this event today, I um, I really started thinking about some of the things that, and, and I have this great job where people tell me about what's going on in their regions and they they talk about their projects, although, you know, I wish I, I oftentimes wish I knew more than, than what's going on uh, out there. But, um, you know, we, we went um, into a, a fairly substantial recession in Texas uh, beginning in the month of March of 2020. And uh, I believe uh, before we started climbing out, uh, we had lost 1.2 million jobs. And, you know, in, in modern Texas, that's unheard of. And, uh, and, and so we, we um, you know, we took quite a hit, just like the rest of the country, the rest of the world, for that matter. One of the things that uh, in, in the site location uh, marketplace, that I think helped us was an attitude um, probably earlier than other places in the country that we were um, 
open for business, that we would work around the pandemic, um, that that we were uh, able to and willing and able to get on airplanes and uh, and visit prospects and invited prospects to visit with us if that's what they wanted to do. Um, you know that kind of fits in with the spirit uh, of that Texas is business friendly. You know, a lot of times uh, politicians in our state talk about our great tax advantages and and those uh, you know the 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 economics of uh, economic development and business development. Uh, you know, that's partially true, but we're not uh, significantly better than most of the states, but we do enjoy uh, some unique advantages and, 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 and those advantages are, are here uh, for us in a pandemic or in a quote, normal situation. And, and, and those, the, the most significant of those uh, simply our geographic location in the middle of the Southern tier of the United States, in the middle of the NAFTA trade corridor. And then these great infrastructure investments that, that have been made uh, in our state over the years, uh, not, not the least of which are massive um, uh, airports, again, situated in the middle of the country in the central time zone, uh, and seaports, uh, 18 seaports uh, along the Texas Gulf Coast. So those are the kinds of things that that give us, I think, a natural a advantage going into a site location search. And then we have, uh, you know, local professionals like like Chuck, like Nathan, literally hundreds of more that are really good at doing economic development at the local level. And and as anyone knows that that um, you, you know, has looked closely at the way we do economic development in Texas, it's a decidedly local endeavor. Uh, we are bottoms up um, in the way we do economic development as opposed to top down. Um, you know, most of our site searches begin with regional organizations or simply the the, the organizations that have been targeted uh, on a map. And um, and and over time, we get the state involved, and and while the state plays an important role, um, generally speaking, um, it's on the communities, it's on the cities, uh, it's on the regions to take care of their own um, economic development initiatives. You know, one other thing I'd I'd like to mention that I've heard from people, and I'm sure that Chuck and Nathan uh, are going to um, to talk about this as well is this issue of labor availability and uh, you know they they live in a part of the state that's very attractive uh, for manufacturing investment when i talk to our members there you know a lot of times i hear well you know it's really hard to find um you know enough employees to to staff a lot of the projects that we're looking at well uh, one of the things that I see that's going on, and I'd love to hear their um, side of this story, is that um, it's like uh, a, a lot of the prospects that are looking at, at parts of the state with that as a worry are simply saying, you know what, we're going to pay X percentage um, over the prevailing wage in that region. We expect that when we move forward, not if, but when we move forward, in Central Texas, in Northeast Texas, um, in South Central Texas, wherever that might be, the people are going to show up, and and the talent is going to show up, and 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 work in in our factory or our manufacturing operation, our back office, whatever it might be. Um, that 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 indicates a high level of confidence that people are still willing to relocate to our state, uh, and that there's people um, that that um, are perhaps uh, underemployed that that would move into um, the the facility that's considering a certain area. So um, you know, I when I think about the pandemic's impact, uh, I I it was substantial. Uh, we've climbed out of it, but I I don't think it really changed anything. Um, you know, related to 
uh, our advantages beforehand and, and our advantages afterwards. Uh, I, I will say this, as a resident of Austin, Texas, known for its traffic, uh, I am just on a daily basis amazed that two years after we started the pandemic, my commute still is about 15 minutes and it was easily 45 minutes to go six miles, by the way, from my house to downtown Austin. And I can get on to uh, Mopac, uh, the main artery that I take into downtown Austin at any time between seven and nine, and it's still 15 minutes. So it is just a indicative of how many people in Austin and in the Austin region work from home. It, it's, it's mind boggling. Even the outbound commute, which was always even worse, is nowhere near what it used to be. So I, I, I'm, I must say I'm a little bit worried about how that will affect um, real estate, uh, corporate real estate in Austin. Uh, it, certainly if that trend continues, and, and there's a lot of people around here that feel the same way, but it is a testament to um, you know, the resilience of the, of the local workforce and their adaptation to, to, to working from home. Um, anyway, I'm I'm uh, I'm going to be quiet. Listen to our local economic development experts, and uh, if you want me to jump in, Elisa, at a later point, be happy to do that. But glad to be here and glad to be a part of this really great panel. Excellent. Thank you so much, Carlton. I've been taking notes as you're chatting, and I think there's so many interesting things that we can unpack in addition with our other panelists. Um, Certainly, I, I appreciate the silver lining of the reduced commute, but aware that this is a complex issue. The shift to work from home, the idea of remote work, is probably going to be one of the most profound impacts on economic development, on real estate, as you say. It just affects so many other things. What does it mean for talent, for labor, um, and for our communities, quite frankly? So nope. thank you for, for that. I really appreciate that. I'm going to pass this over to you now, um, Chuck. And let me um, hand you the presenter controls as well so you can share your screen. Uh, let us know if you have any uh, difficulties doing that. Um, and as I said, Chuck uh, is with the East Texas Council of Government and uh, Council of Governments, rather. Uh, it's a large region in East Texas, and we'll be able to talk about that. So you may need to grab it from the very bottom in your dock. There you go. Perfect. Oh, you're muted. We're not able to hear you for some reason. How about now? We're good to go. That sounds great. And you might want to do a presentation on the slideshow just so we can see it uh, bigger under slideshow. You could just click on present. That way we'll be able to see the. There you go. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. It looks beautiful. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Elisa. This is uh, Chuck Vanderbilt um, here in East Texas. I'm the Community and Economic Development Manager, and uh, I just want to share some information uh, with everyone. Uh, you know, just some trends that I've been seeing. I was uh, fortunate enough to hear Dr. Ray Perriman speak uh, in Tyler, uh, you know, not too long ago, and some of the things that he pointed out I thought were interesting uh, on a national level. Uh, seeing consumer prices and interest rates are expected to go up slightly over the next five years. And I, and I think people are seeing that uh, or at least anticipate rates to rise a little bit, uh, at least in the next year or so. Uh, the bottlenecks that were at the ports uh, still remain a problem, though there are signs uh, of improvement there. And as uh, was already mentioned, labor shortages do continue. It's a tight labor market uh, that employers are working with. Um, on the state level, uh, obviously oil and gas remains a major component of the Texas economy and the energy sector has increased significantly since the pandemic. So we're seeing a little bit of a rebound there, according to Dr. Perryman. Uh, the Texas economy is expected to outpace the growth in most parts of the United States. And uh, he really anticipates the service industry uh, to drive job gains uh, in Texas. 
Uh, also, Texas population is forecasted to grow by 2 million over the next uh, five years. So just some, some interesting notes there on the state level. Uh, at the regional level, some more uh, towards East Texas and the Smith County greater area. Of course, ETCOG serves 14 counties here in East Texas. So we, we do cover a wide geographic territory. But at a regional level, you know, core industries such as healthcare and higher education are growing and expanding. Uh, there's a new medical school coming in at UT Tyler. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of growth in those industries. Uh, the rate of population and real gross product expansion in the, in the Tyler metropolitan area is a, it's still expected to exceed the rest of the United States. Uh, projected industry growth leaders include mining, services, manufacturing, information, wholesale, and retail. Um, we are using GIS planning as a, as a tool, and I've pulled some, inf some data from that tool so you get an idea of the region that we serve here. Um, you can see the East Texas Council of Governments has a population of almost 900,000. Uh, and you can see the breakdown there of uh, gender and age. Businesses and jobs, uh, you can see uh, some of the trends that we're seeing, including retail and healthcare. Income and spending for our region, this is kind of gives you a snapshot of what, where our, our dollars are going. Shelter, transportation, food and beverages, healthcare, utilities. Um, so this is the kind of information we find uh, good for businesses to know, uh, so that they can get an, an understanding of their customer um, as they look to relocate here. Um, as Elisa mentioned, my office also does SBA 504 lending, which is designed specifically for commercial real estate. And I've got a, a chart here that kind of shows you the effective lending rates. Um, as you can see, uh, you know, with the 504, you can get a 20-year note or a 25-year note, and those effective rates are just uh, around that 3% and just creeping above that. Uh, but that obviously, you can see the drop that took place, and then uh, so rates are increasing slightly over time. Um, but again, this is a, an SBA lending vehicle that offers a fixed interest rate in a long term, and obviously 3% is going to be more uh, beneficial for a business, especially a startup, than a conventional note that has a higher interest rate and likely a variable rate. Uh, just so you get an idea of what it looked like in 2021, uh, SBA 504 lending, you can see uh, the number. Uh, uh, the dollars amount, the number of loans, the jobs created. Um, so you can really get an idea of the dollars and the size of uh, projects that go out on a national level. Um, I do want to point out the top 10 district offices on the national level. DFW came in at number four. So DFW is really leading uh, a leading territory uh, for SBA lending. And, and you know, we're doing everything we can here in East Texas as part of that region to uh, reach the rural communities uh, and those businesses to put those dollars to work. Within uh, our SBA 504 region, Region 6, uh, DFW ranked number one. So that's over Houston, San Antonio, uh, et cetera. So definitely very active here in East Texas with SBA lending and my office is always uh, ready and willing to help uh, access those funds for small businesses. So uh, that's just a quick overview of some of the things I thought would be helpful for folks to, to know. And, um, but yeah, you know, we're really looking to serve um, our economic development district here in East Texas, which is mostly comprised of rural territories, um, using tools like GIS planning to provide to them, um, because a lot of our, uh, our jurisdictions either don't have an economic development corporation or have a very limited budget. Um, so my team's always looking at uh, how we can uh, help those folks uh, be better at economic development for their communities. And, and so as we look at it as a, as a regional level, we felt that this tool was really helpful to uh, spur economic development and get the word out because East Texas, it, it does have, it has the natural resources. It's got the highways, it's got the water, it's got the rail, it's got the airports. Um, so I do feel like our region is uh, 
going to continue to see an increase in economic development and businesses coming this direction. Um, and, and again, my office is here to do what we can to facilitate those conversations with the counties, the cities, uh, to just you know increase that economic development impact as much as possible. Great, Chuck, thank you so much. Uh, really interesting to see these numbers out there. And I think you're picking up also on some of the things that Carlton was talking about in terms of the natural advantages that the state as a whole has that will kind of, if not pandemic proof, then certainly speak to uh, recovery and, and resurgence and growth going forward. I also love the regional um, approach. This is definitely a dominant trend that we're seeing in economic development in general. Um, if you have smaller communities, more remote or isolated communities who would not otherwise be able to compete in a um, in an economic development context, being able to work together as a region helps to uh, to drive more um, more attention their way. Um, so great. I, I'm going to again hold uh, questions until afterwards, but I want to uh, pass this on next to Nathan. Tafoya, who's the executive director of Mount Pleasant at EDC. Nathan, did you have any slides you wanted to share with us today? I can make you a presenter. Oh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, no. Can you hear me? Yes, we certainly no, can. No, no okay. uh, just, uh, just, just my face. Sorry. That's, That's a, all right. Okay. I mean, I, That's great. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, no, thanks for having us. And um, yeah, Chuck and I are, are are in East Texas. And for those listeners who may who may not know, Texas. I mean, you go to Wikipedia, there's like, there are parts of Texas that are closer to California, Disneyland, than they are to the other side of Texas. And we're, we're the other side of Texas. <laughs> we're the other side. And there's just, the geography is so massive. And um, I mean, you know, the East Texas is, is super interesting. I've also practiced in, um, in other states, but uh, I was also in West Texas. And so there's a lot of, there's certainly a lot of differences between, um, Chuck was talking about rural um, uh, regions and, and kind of his clientele. and the just rural in East Texas, which there tend to be some a lot of, is, is it's not the same thing as rural in West Texas and other parts. I would even imagine in South Texas. And so one of the biggest differences I noticed was population density. You may have smaller towns, and you know I think Chuck's in like Tyler, and um, but if if you look at um, Dallas, there's I-20 comes down and it kind of triangles out, and then I-30 kind of goes north. <clears throat> and so uh, Chuck's not kind of on the I-20 corridor. I'm imagining, and then I'm on the I-30 corridor, um, about to where Mount Pleasant's about two hours from Dallas, and so the it's so interesting to me. Like, there's trees everywhere, there's lakes, right? There's no tumbleweeds. It's not that's not happening over here. Um, you know, you get the fall change, co the color changes, and um, there's a lot of boating, lake culture, and so and hunting. <clears throat> but um, I think more Louisiana, I think than than tumbleweeds, <laughs> and think of that that more uh, that more green. Uh, lush stuff. So there's water and there's there's that abundance of of water and 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 the population density. So I think what's I think what's interesting is about um, the when it comes to the labor force. I think that's I'm wondering. You know, first off, I think everyone in our region kind of uses a a drive time, and I think a lot of people coming to Texas and people native to Texas don't really understand how much Texans drive. They think it's normal, but Texans drive to work. They drive. Um, they spend a lot of time in their, their trucks and their cars, and even in West Texas, you know, going a, an hour away to get to the oil fields. Um, and, and here, like, th there are people in Mount Pleasant who drive other places, and we get people from an hour away. So we all, we all have this right around a 60-minute drive time labor shed um, that, that we kind of share with. And so our population, when you, we, when you draw that 60-minute drive time, is still significant. It's still, like, around a million uh, people. And... I think what's interesting about the 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 labor the labor issue is the labor availability is is that shift and I, I and I, maybe you want you're going to follow up on I don't want to tap into that Alyssa but um, this hybrid remote work thing is I'm super interested in and I think is really fascinating and I think as economic developers we got to really pivot on but in East Texas what's interesting because of uh, as Chuck kind of alluded to, like that quality of life, that kind of rural, and as people go to the suburbs and kind of come out and get away a little bit, um, we have this really interesting opportunity, um, especially in East Texas, um, to really capture some of that and to be really innovative and smart about how we um, market those, market our region, and <clears throat> and and really, 
elevate using you know a lot of the federal opportunities that are coming out with broadband to really make our region robust <clears throat> from a uh, connectivity level. And so, I mean, in, in, in Mount Pleasant, one of the things that we're working on is, uh, is, is we have this really interesting opportunity where we lease a building or a space from the chamber, but to dislocate ourselves, to make this run our corner, to make this a commercial space, and then actually create a new, uh, build our own office and create like a co-working, um, kind of a, a remote work where entrepreneurs can kind of come in and we're, we're centralizing business resources. We have a, an SBDC in Mount Pleasant bringing everybody in house, centralizing all of our, all the business stuff. And um, so we're, we're really excited about that. And it's to serve this kind of hybrid, you know, renting out rooms where people can come in, you know, they don't want to stay at home all the time, but they can and have really good fiber and internet. And so they, where they can have meetings and have that official kind of, they feel like, you know, taking off their pajamas and putting on a tie, they can and come to a place, rent it for, you know, you know, 45 bucks a day or something. And so really trying to capture that and say, listen, this is where you, you should do it. You should come to it. Uh, this area and so I and uh, you know then go back home to the look at the pine trees and um, uh, so there's that's a, a really interesting um, component I think when it's when we talk about labor shortage we have a lot of in East Texas I feel like a lot of food production um, you know pre uh, Campbell's and Tyson and all those sorts of things and pilgrims and so uh, I, I think that's it's been really interesting to see wages and all those sorts of things have uh, occur um, here and in this region um, as, as the, as, you know, par as that meets parity, I feel like with a, a denser population or a more urban population. Um, uh, but I think it is good overall for the, for the overall community. But, um, I, you know, I, I, uh, I'll, I'll just shut up there, but I, 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 um, yeah, I'll just shut up. Alyssa, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. I, I'm really interesting things that you're talking about. I think the, idea of co-working spaces this was even before the pandemic was a really interesting idea i think um it, it allows people as you say to take off the pajamas and get out there and of course it also has this secondary impact of driving more footfall to uh, surrounding cafe cafes or coffee shops and restaurants um retail uh, around those just to get people out of their houses of course has that uh, beneficial impact on communities and and neighborhoods and downtown areas as well as quickly as well if it's almost and it's for gis planning but we also because we use gis planning but using these third-party tools and being really lean and technologically um available um having stuff online right to assist small businesses but then also create high creating hybrid you know physical space as well and creating you know critical mass and in, in terms you know uh carlton mentioned you know commercial real estate in austin and that concern of all right what do we do with these really big buildings um if people are working from home but creating um on on a quasi-government level like place these gathering places where you can sort of do the and, and it works with you not there or and with you there and just these really uh, multifunctional um spaces and um i and so and then being really lean and with and with gis planning and these third-party kind of um, technology and data tools that we can use to help, you know, the public and, and entrepreneurs and small biz. So one of the things that we've been hearing since the start of the pandemic is the increasing digitization of the site selection process itself, that more and more uh, site selectors, businesses making location decisions, whether they're small businesses or big ones, are going online to do the research that they're expecting more sophistication in terms of virtual tours and uh, you know, modeling and all of those different things. In fact, we're hearing stories of complete site selection processes happening without a single in-person visit, uh, which is hard to imagine even two years ago, but, um, but this is becoming, you know, if not the norm yet, it's less uh, of an outlier than it used to be. Is that something you're seeing in your communities or can you talk about how that digitization of site selection has become uh, relevant in your regions? Check me. I'll I'll go. I'll start. So one of the things that um, I think every academic developer would would say, you know, it's it's been the mantra. Everything's going. Um, uh, everything has been going online, right? The research, all the site selection research. So if if EDCs were not on that curve in the first place, they were they were already behind. So I mean, absolutely, in the site selection world, um, at least the level one due diligence. Is absolutely now like where it was probably definitely a thing any site selector who probably isn't or you know they're going to get aged out if they're not participating in that piece 
the companies aren't going to be using them. So that's definitely probably anchored now. And then I would imagine, you know, you talked about this being an outlier, or right? a, a full site selection. That would be difficult, I imagine, in, in any uh, situation. But um, yeah, I, I think in, in our world, um, we're really trying to, well, economic developers should be reducing time, cost, and risk. And if you, in that risk part, saying, hey, it's already been certified by, you know, engineers and, you know, site selection, kind of getting those certifications for your sites and just to make them as available as possible, say, to make them feel as comfortable as possible to get to that maybe visiting one or two sites only and then making a decision is absolutely going to be critical. And it always has been, um, but perhaps more so now. Okay, thank you. What do you think, Chuck? You know, uh, with that not being an EDC myself and looking at it as a regional issue, um, obviously technology is huge. And to what you know drew us to provide GIS planning to our 14 counties was that ability to it for them to uh, immediately digitize their inventory as far as real estate and make that easily shareable um, and then then use all of the the data sets uh, to help market the area because you can use that data to help you tell that story and sell your area uh, but the ability also because again I'm part of a council of governments and we do so many different things uh, the ability to upload uh, our own sets of data into uh, the tool and allow our jurisdictions that might have certain things or certain uh, KMZ maps or files that they want to throw in. Um, you know, that really helps us, uh, I think, provide just a, a tremendous way to reduce costs, make them more effective, as Nathan was pointing out. Um, and again, a lot of the territories we serve, you know, if they don't have an, an economic development corporation, sometimes the city manager is the EDC director. And, and, you know, so we really think about those individuals and, and those members of the Council of Governments and how we can best serve them. And if we're thinking about them, the rest of our counties typically is like, yeah, that's a great idea. And, and the buy in is really easy. But we really try to put those those communities at, at our front of mind to try to serve them and, and find solutions for them that we can offer the 14 counties. So um, I can't speak to, you know, full site selections being digital, but just uh, uh, making this available to communities that previously had no way of doing this type of thing is, is very powerful. And we expect uh, uh, a high usage rate in our 14 counties. Obviously, we have some communities that are, are, you know, very strong and know and have strong leadership and a strong budget to, to manage their economic development efforts. But the majority of our territories do not. And uh, so we are always trying to be aggressive in, in finding tools and solutions for them uh, so that we can continue to capture uh, the businesses that are coming to Texas. You know, they're coming to Texas. Um, where they land in Texas, uh, we're, we're trying to get them to, to see that quality of life that East Texas offers and the uh, available natural resources um, that we offer. And again, we have a, a lot of higher education institutions here in East Texas. So as far as workforce you know, being tight, we do have a lot of high participation uh, at these institutions to try to uh, work together with economic developers to produce those workers once they come out of the classroom. So uh, that collaboration is a really big deal. And I know is a, we're having a lot of conversations in that realm um, out of my office as well. Okay, Carlton, I'd be interested to hear your perspective as a kind of bigger picture from Texas and so kind of digitization of site selection overall. Is this something you're hearing from TDC members, something you're seeing? Absolutely. <clears throat> You know, and I, I'd like to just comment on something that that Nathan said, and 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 this is a trend that that that's emerging, particularly with some of the projects that are going around the state, and and that is the availability of big sites. Um, certainly, not every community can have a, a site that would accommodate uh, accommodate um, an EV plant. But we do have enough in the state. We do have uh, an, an enough of these kinds of sites to to keep us in the game. You know, sites that are 500 acres, a thousand, even 2,000 acres. 
some of these are served uh, with utilities, some aren't, but with the economic development sales tax in, in, in 700 plus of our communities, um, there is some likelihood that there would be enough reserves available in an EDC to quickly serve a site that's not served with water and sewer um, and electric infrastructure. So, um, you know, we, we do have land that is not always available in other states. Certainly other states are, are aware of the need for big sites to, to get big projects. But I, again, I think uh, the way we're funded and um, simply the, the availability of land uh, on which to place a massive project, a, an electric vehicle uh, uh, assembly facility, for example, um, gives us looks uh, that, or, or, or gives us several looks in several locations in the state that we might not ordinarily have. Okay. Interesting. That's interesting. And that, again, as you said at the beginning, there's another kind of advantage, that funding advantage that, uh, that the state has. Uh, Carlton, since you are our, our TEDC director, can you speak to what you're seeing in West Texas um, and in other parts of the state? Um, I know we have representation a little bit more on the east side over here. I'd be interested in what you see as trends on the west side of the state. Well, I mean, uh, there's certainly uh, projects going on. I think West Texas, uh, west of I-35 is often just kind of forgotten. And um, and and that's that that that's unfortunate and inaccurate. Uh, you know, uh, you see places like um, like Abilene recently has done uh, a couple of really big projects in in the food space, um, cheese processing and packaging. You see that in um, in the Panhandle. You've seen several of those kinds of projects. Uh, in, in the Lubbock region, you've seen projects related, um, you know, to the ag industry. Uh, I know Lubbock's been trying to take advantage of that for literally decades, um, but it's, it's finally coming to fruition. Um, so, um, you know, there's, there's really uh, projects going on in West Texas um, and, and uh, sound um, economic development organizations, um, and also projects related to the energy industry. Um, you know, our CETA award winner um, this year, uh, one of our CETA award winners was in Odessa, where uh, they're doing a, 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 a multi-billion dollar project that's, that's related to carbon capture. So, uh, you know, don't don't write off West Texas. There's there's a lot of successful um, cities in West Texas, and and they're and they're doing just fine, um, e even though the 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 majority of the really the, the 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 kinds of hype about Texas are always about the Texas Triangle. So uh, there's excellent economic development organizations. They've got sites. They've got the wherewithal. Um, to do the kinds of projects uh, that can be, um, you know, uh, away from the major metropolitan areas. So, uh, just a reminder to our uh, attendees, you're welcome to uh, put questions in the questions fields in the GoToWebinar control panel. I have a number of questions uh, that have been coming in, but we're uh, always happy to, to see them. Um, I'd love to hear, we talked a little bit about labor shortage, about talent pool. Um, how how do you see different economic developers uh, addressing this? Um, and also, I guess, Chuck and Nathan, I, I'm interested to hear from your perspective. I know you spoke about the proximity of uh, research universities and colleges nearby as a kind of source of, of talent. But how do we address the talent shortage in general? And how do we deal with this kind of maybe work from home, uh, remote workers that allow people, I guess, to be anywhere theoretically uh, and working for different businesses? I invite any of you to jump in. You know, uh, I'll mention for re remote work because that, that speaks to our broadband effort, which is, uh, I think, one of our biggest challenges here in East Texas. Um, 
because it's not just a work issue, it's an education issue, it's a healthcare issue, it's a quality of life issue. Um, I'm seeing a lot of trends move to seeing uh, broadband as a utility, not a luxury. Um, and, and so we've been doing a, a big effort uh, for planning to uh, identify specific high leverage projects in our 14 counties. Um, we know federal dollars are coming down specifically for broadband. So we're doing what we can to uh, put our communities in a good spot to apply for these funds and have successful applications be submitted um, so that they can capture some of those dollars because the, the remote work, the remote learning, uh, healthcare and everything else is such a big issue. Um, now, in regards to higher ed and economic development, uh, I'll speak, uh, I'll use an example. Rush Harris out of Marshall, uh, Texas is working directly with the ISDs, working directly with Texas State Technical College. He's got East Texas Baptist University. He's got Wiley College, all in this one community. And, and he's done a really good job to bring those folks together, the stake, uh, stakeholders together. Um, to identify what the workforce needs are and then how he can assist the, the higher ed institutions with creating that pipeline that meets the needs of, that, of, of those uh, employers. And he's done a really good job. It, and it's, it's not easy. It's uphill. It's hard work. But um, this, it, it's, you know, I see this current time uh, as, as our time as economic developers to shine. You know? Throughout the pandemic, this is really this is our time to to be in economic development and try to fight these these big problems that these communities are facing and come up with solutions. So it, it's not an easy thing; it's an uphill battle every day. I feel, but uh, it's a necessary one. And because if we don't address broadband and these things, um, you know, our communities will be left behind. These, like I said, these businesses are coming to the state of Texas; they're going to go somewhere. We've got to to do what we can to position our region to capture those businesses. Yeah, that's great examples. I love the example that you're giving of Rush Harris and Marshall, and I love that idea of, of economic developers kind of seeing these challenges and opportunities and being able to quickly adapt to them. I think I've I've heard Amy Madison at uh, Pflugerville talk about they had this reskilling academy that they quickly put into place at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, she probably will speak about this far more uh, um, uh, accurately than I will, but that it struck me as another example of there was a need and the economic developer saw that and was able to respond in trying to assist this, uh, this retraining to keep talent there and to help businesses find the workers that they actually need. Uh, Nathan, what do you what would you say about uh, about labor shortage, or what does that actually mean in your in your community? Um, so, like, I would just say holistically, I think I agree with like with Chuck. You saying broadband, I mean, but if you're talking about remote work and and people living, so I think what's the, the most interesting thing about that I think has happened in the last twenty years in economic development, as I understand it, is people used to we used to move to where businesses were, right? Those the big companies. Now mm -hmm. businesses move to where people want to live. And so being really engaging your community holistically on housing, education, all those sorts of things is really our job. Now, how do we make this a quality place where people want to live so companies want to be here? And, and I think the job right now, as Chuck was saying, is to ride the wave, to ride the paradigm shift. If there's a shift, like get into the crack and, like, and, and, and use that momentum um, to get, you know, to, to move political will um to you to move you know things within the community that and people understand it sometimes they don't know how to articulate it um but it's the economic developers job to articulate and and what is happening and how they can best use that paradigm shift to to move it in and and favorably and so you know if you were talking about remote work i know wichita falls is doing a really interesting program they've gotten a lot of press on it um i know i mean and i know mckinney's doing done a, done a really great job with uh going after tech companies and finding places for them to house and so finding these places where people can <clears throat> come in, but if you're talking about remote, remote work, where are these people gonna live? If you're in these, like what Chuck was saying, we have these rural communities, how, are, the, are there housing developments set aside? Are we doing things that would allow different kinds of housing, um, housing stock to approach at, at every like kind of level um, for Gen Zers to millennials to Xers and boomers? Like this, how do you, you know, are we, are we matching their needs? And so being 
more like a private, being very a study of human behavior and understanding where people are going to want to live and not, and companies like and, and not main you know not losing the basics and the fundamentals, um, not removing the ancient landmark landmarks of of you know economic development, but also now we got to study human behavior and and how do we maximize that? And so you know I mean even here in Mount Pleasant using the same kind of concepts, like we have this great training facilities here. We've began, we've begun giving scholarships to our college. You can get your MBA and there's a te Texas A&M is also uh, at, at Texas Arcana at NTCC uh, is here. We have this amazing training facility. Um, and we also, have, we've been giving uh, scholarships to, uh, for the, they, they started a new trucking program because um, we distribution and logistics are a target industry. So how do we back in and start preparing the pipeline uh, for those companies that we're also going after? So. Um, very holistically, as like Chuck was saying, it's not going to be like, it's always going to be, yes, the companies and what are we doing with education and training and all those sorts of things. But it's like, now, do we have good housing? Do we have like amazing fiber? Or it's, it's those things too. I, I love that idea of ride the wave. And to me, it also seems like a lot of this is a huge opportunity for smaller communities where maybe they don't necessarily have the businesses there, but People have shown this desire, especially magnified by the pandemic, to move to places where that quality of life is. They don't maybe don't always want to be in bigger cities. A huge moment for exurbs, suburbs, smaller communities. How, as economic developers in smaller towns, practically do you tell the story in a compelling way about quality of life in your town? What would that look like to you in economic development for workforce attraction? How do you tell those stories? How do you reach With those people? Planning. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I did not in any way mean to say, yeah, that, that's actually, that's not what I'm, I, I guess to speak to the talent themselves, like the yeah. work. Um, what do those stories look like? Is it video? Is it social? Is it sponsored ads? Is it virtual tours? Is it beautiful images? Are you doing profiles of people in your community? Um, and I mean, I'm just interested to hear what you're seeing. And Carlton, I'd love to hear what you're seeing across the state. Um, this. You know, uh, it, it it doesn't surprise me that a, a, a big thinker like Nathan has, has thought about this. And, um, it, you know, one of the, the most exciting things about the pandemic is I think it's accelerated a lot of things that were going to happen anyway. And this idea of companies moving to where the people are or where the people want to be uh, was probably something that was set into place years ago. In fact, I know it was years ago. Um, COVID has accelerated that. But what's exciting and interesting to me is how how much of that will uh, will remain. How much of it will or how much will we revert back to, you know, going to an office um, or not living in 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 a along a beautiful lake in East Texas and simply living in a, a suburb or a city? Uh, that's what's so what's exciting about that is the unknown. And I think you know our job at in an organization like the TDC is to expose our members into what's going on cutting edge in economic development, um, you know, like Nathan um, and Chuck were referring to uh, in terms of people, you know, wanting to live one place, but, but perhaps uh, work another. And uh, uh, I, I don't know that we know. I, I really don't. And that's, that's interesting. It's scary, but it's also exciting. Um, and and what, what does that mean for Texas? What does it mean for East Texas? What does it mean for you know the remote parts of our state? Uh, will will they be adversely affected, uh, or will they will people um, you know we know that there's there are people fleeing cities. Will people want to live in rural West Texas? Uh, know everybody that lives in their town, and uh, you know work for a company that's in California, New York, Illinois, or even Houston. So. Uh, I, th I think a lot of that, unfortunately, is unknown, but um, it's going to take people like Chuck and like Nathan and a newer generation of economic developers to think this through. Um, it, our business is forever changed, and that's okay, 
Uh, but I think, you know, the TDC is going to have to educate not only our members or help them find the solutions to those issues, but we have to uh, educate elected officials and policymakers that yeah. economic development um, that that Mount Pleasant might prosper without big announcements, just because people want to live there, because they have a great school district, they they have an awesome quality of life, they everybody knows everybody, it's a safe place to live, it's got a wonderful downtown, all of these kinds of things that, that people want, but it may not show up in a 500 employee plant. It may show up in 500 new people living there that make over $100,000 a year working somewhere else, okay? And what what what's, I, I keep going back to that, what is interesting to me about it is, can we pull that off? We, yeah. we better, as economic developers, we better be able to pull that off and convince the policymakers and elected officials that this truly is economic development. And we know that it is, but, um, you know, we we got to change the 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 paradigm for people to understand that that uh, that that truly is economic development at the local level. Yeah, that's a really great point. I mean, like in normal times, most people didn't really know what economic development meant or what people do. Like, if there's always this kind of but to, so people are more aware of it now, but you're right. I think uh, the power of an association such as yours and the work of economic developers on the ground to educate their elected officials, to bring their community stakeholders, to make the connections like you're describing were happening in Marshall and other places to connect with, um, you know, uh, post-secondary education. Uh, all of those things are really important. And people, even regular folks on the ground who aren't connected to this profession are more aware of the need for these kinds of things. So an association such as TDC would absolutely uh, be well, and And, and if, if, if I could, Elisa, I, I might add, I'm not worried about Nathan or Chuck or Rush Harris and Marshall or any number of our sort of next wave of economic development professionals. What I'm worried about is the disconnect between what they do and what they're seeing and how the world is changing and the people uh, that are being elected to public public office in in those places because I don't think the gap between uh, their knowledge and professionalism and the knowledge uh, of of local elected officials has ever been wider. That's very troubling to me uh, that we're not uh, that the the folks that we're electing to public office um, are not as in tune with. Um, really what's going on in the world. Um, unfortunately, in a lot of places, we're, we're electing these keyboard warriors to, uh, to, to be, um, you know, to hold public office, whether that's county commissioner, mayor, city council person, whatever. And, um, you know, they're, they're interested in clicks and interested in what's happening on Facebook and not understanding, you know, what the heck is going on in the real world. Right. And, in you know, you know, one thing I want to try to urge our members to do is to be better leaders of those people. Now, you know, folks like Nathan, they're hired by um, boards that uh, answer to elected officials. But the trick is for for Nathan and Chuck and and, you know, you talked about Rush and Marshall and literally hundreds of other um, of our newer professionals is how do you figure out a way to lead people who don't know the heck what you're doing and don't know what 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 the marketplace is going to or looking like and uh, i think you just have to, our our professionals have to be better at that uh, which is one of the reasons we try to you know we're we've set up a leadership program we're trying to do um really uh, the softer skills stuff in economic development, as much as the 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 passing along the knowledge, the harder knowledge, um, that that again uh, our our professionals know uh, in spades, but it's it's the tricky part of being effective, doing your job, but leading people who are ostensibly leading you. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe doing it in such a way that they don't always necessarily realize that's what you're doing, but kind of guiding. <laughs> Guidance, 
leadership. I, I see right. that. I see what that's a those specific set of skills. And it's interesting, there's been a lot of um, turnover, maybe more than normal among Texas EDCs in the past year. I don't know if that's something you see continuing in 2022. Maybe also an opportunity to bring in this kind of new folks into the field and get them excited about what economic developers do to support their communities. Absolutely. Um, and and our, newer, um, our newer leaders, in economic development are, um, you know, are, are generally more well-rounded, uh, generally understand um, the whole of economic development rather than skins on the wall, jobs created, those kinds of things. And that's what we need at this point in time. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're, we're coming to the end of the hour. Uh, Chuck, Nathan, do you guys have anything else you'd either like to add about that or any other points that you really wanted to make uh, on our general topic of uh, opportunities and challenges for 2022 as it relates to your regions? Well, I'll say um, just two things on what Chuck, uh, uh, Carlin said. Um, one, I think the silver lining with that gap um, is like, you know, you were saying, Alyssa, like, Economic development is more is has become more layman. Uh, and it's more democratized now. I mean, I don't have to. We used to have to refer to the the Perrymans and the, all the data scientists and their their white papers. Now I can go like, well, the Washington Post, like the New York Times, like I, we can. It's I can refer to an actual uh, event talking about economic development principles um, that are being published by journalists now. Um, mm. So it's not that's a, a silver lining. And that gap and then like what TEDC is doing with understanding that helping kind of back in and help with the educational process is, is good. Um, and I, I would just say the other, the, and it's true, it's a challenge, but when it comes to even using this paradigm shift and this wave, um, I think one of the selling points, it is for me at least, in doing this is the same thing I would say for a, a project, you know, bringing fiber infrastructure, putting it in, what if they don't come? Like, so we improve our school districts, we make Main Street amazing, we have new restaurants, and gosh darn it, we didn't bring more people. But we're a better city. Like, how did we lose? And, um, and I think that's what's, I mean, you can sell right now and say, hey, we have this opportunity to get, and and if we don't, all we do is get better. Tell me how we lose on that. And so that, that's a good way to just really to to talk about this this opportunity that's happening in 2021. Um, that's just so weird in history right yeah thank you no i would uh, i would just add that uh, your you know communities economic developers you know i, I point to this being a, a tremendous time in economic development and, and an opportunity to really uh get your hands dirty and, and see some big things happen um it's uh especially for for the rural communities that, that we serve it is such a, a challenge but I, I could give you anecdotal evidence all day long of people moving from brooklyn new york to 30 acre farms here in east texas mm -hmm. um that can work remotely and it, 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 we're, we're seeing that all over the region and a lot of our communities um, so again, as economic developers, when you if you can find a way to focus on that quality of life and help your community tell that story, um, I think you'll attract whether you know you'll get those professionals and, and you know these guys are making good money, which means they're going to spend that good money in your community. Um, so you've got to find a way to not only attract these workers um, that are looking for a little bit of slower pace out of the city. Uh, but you've got to be able to keep them there. Uh, you know, they can't move out. They want to move to that, that farm, but they have to have Internet access so that they can do their work. And, and so, uh, you know, whether it's a business, whether it, it's the individual, um, you know, I think we're going to be hearing about broadband for a very long time because um, it, it, it is such a key component uh, for all facets of life really going forward. So. Um, you know, always try to have that on the on the forefront of your economic development efforts. And, and like Nathan pointed to, try to think forward, you know, have that infrastructure there for the, the years to come, not for the project today, because um, that will put you in a better spot to to fill those spots 
as this as the trend is likely to continue. So um, again, we've got the resources. We just have to make it aware uh, that this stuff is available, and you've got these places, and, and you've got to make it easy for these folks to move in uh, by providing some simple infrastructure, which now includes broadband. So. Uh, I just want to make sure, you know, I'm available. Uh, if anybody needs anything, any questions, you know, uh, I'm here to be a resource to to share information and also to learn from you. So <laughs> I'm always happy to, to have a conversation uh, and, and hear about what's going on in other uh, areas of the state. Thank you. Uh, we have had some requests for your slide deck, so maybe you could share that with me and I'll include a link to that in the email. Um, yes. I know I'd love to see a TV series about a Brooklyn transplant to a farm in East Texas. So maybe mm. that's your I'm, in here, you know, <laughs> tell the story on Netflix. People will come, trust me. You no, know, but yes, uh, but I, there's, there's those anecdotal stories. That just happens to be my brother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I will say, you know, they, they built a little cabin uh, on this 30 acre farm and they have more square footage on this farm in this little cabin than they did in their apartment. In the I have no doubt. I have no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I want to thank all of you for your perspective. This has really been enjoyable. Um, we'll have to do it again sometime. I really uh, have loved hearing your stories and your perspectives and I really appreciate and value your expertise. I want to thank all of our attendees as well who joined us today. I will be sending out an email with a link to this video. Uh, Chuck, Nathan, Carlton, thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you are doing for your communities, for your region, and for the state of Texas. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Be well, stay safe, and take care. Bye-bye.